Now we're going to take a look at two different algorithms, two different processes, by which we can take any basis for a subspace and cook it down into an orthonormal basis for that subspace. The first is called the Gram-Schmidt procedure and kind of is a geometric iterative process that relies heavily upon the geometry present in Rn. The second is a more sophisticated approach from linear algebra called the eigenvector method. It's taught a little bit less, but it might actually be used a little bit more um, out in practice. And specifically, we're going to use it in our facial recognition algorithm. So let's take a look first at Gram-Schmidt and second at the eigenvector method for determining an orthonormal set. But let's look at a second process besides Gram-Schmidt that may, depending on your situation, be a little friendlier to use to determine an orthonormal basis for a subspace. It's called the eigenvector method, and it relies on two facts from linear algebra. The first fact is that if I have a symmetric matrix, so if M is a symmetric matrix, which is K rows and K columns, so it's a K by K symmetric matrix, then two things are true. First of all, the eigenvalues of M are all real numbers, and second, we can find a set of eigenvectors of M which is orthonormal. Better yet, we can find a complete set of K orthonormal eigenvectors of M, which will make a basis for the space RK. So if symmetric matrices, matrices have real eigenvalues, and we can choose the eigenvectors to be orthonormal. How cool is that? So that would appear to give us a way to produce an orthonormal set as eigenvectors of some symmetric matrix. So what symmetric matrix should we use? Here's a second theorem. Let's suppose that I have a matrix n by k whose columns, its k columns, are linearly independent. Maybe these columns will come from a basis, any old basis, for a subspace that we want to try to make orthonormal. Then here's the result. If I know what the eigenvectors of A transpose A are, let's call them x1 up through xk, if I know what those eigenvectors are, according to my theorem from linear algebra, those eigenvectors can be chosen to be orthonormal. In fact, better yet, we're just going to be uh, not too demanding. We're going to choose them to be orthogonal. So if I have an orthogonal set of eigenvectors for the matrix A transpose A, which is a symmetric matrix, by the way, that's how we know we can choose an orthogonal set, then to find an orthogonal basis for the column space of A, all I have to do is multiply those eigenvectors by A. That's pretty handy. If I know how to find the eigenvectors of A transpose A and make them orthogonal, I can choose them to be orthogonal, then all I have to do is multiply them by A, and I get an orthogonal basis for the column space of A, which in the beginning, the column space of A is just the span of a bunch of generic linearly independent columns. We're going to see how this works in practice in just a minute. But first, let's provide a proof of this theorem. All we need to check is that if I pick a pair of AXIs, that AXI quantity transpose AXJ is supposed to give me 0. The AXIs are supposed to be orthogonal one to another. And we're going to use the fact that the XIs are orthogonal one to another. How we can do that is just remembering that the transpose of a matrix product is an anti-involution. In other words, we can uh, switch around the order of the A and the XI and put the transpose on each of them. So AXI quantity transpose is XI transpose A transpose. And so the dot product on the left-hand side of this equation can simplify to XI transpose A transpose AXJ. But what are the XJs? They're nothing more than eigenvectors of A transpose A. But A transpose A is right there in my equation now. So if xj is an eigenvector of A transpose A, then that means that A transpose A, when I multiply it by xj, is going to give me a constant, a scalar, times xj. That's what it means to be an eigenvalue eigenvector pair. Lambda here, by the way, is going to be a real number, although that's not important for this particular argument. But then that means that lambda, because it's a scalar, we can pull out to the front of our dot product and make it lambda times xi transpose xj. But because the xi's are orthogonal, xi transpose xj is equal to 0. And therefore, because the xi's are orthogonal and because they're all eigenvectors of A transpose A, we've proven that the axi's will be mutually orthogonal one to another. And because each of them is in the column space of A, and because the columns of A are linearly independent, the axi's will be linearly independent as well. So this orthogonal set will also be a basis for the column space of A. 
Okay, great. So how do we actually use this to find an orthonormal basis for a given set? The method will just be to treat it like it's a projection problem. First, find any basis at all for our subspace S, build a matrix with the columns equal to that basis, and then compute the eigenvectors of A transpose A. Hopefully this will not be too tricky of a problem to do, uh, but we could always use a computer to do it if we needed to. Then we just have to multiply each of those eigenvectors by A, and if they're not already unit length, we'll just divide them by their length to normalize them. So here's our example. Let's choose a couple of vectors in R4, 1, 1, 0, 0, and 1, 0, 1, 0. And S is the subspace spanned by these two vectors. You can check that this is definitely not an orthonormal set. Not only is V1 transpose V2 not equal to 0, V1 transpose V1 and V2 transpose V2 are also not equal to 1. So we don't have orthogonality and we don't have unit length. Let's see how this method will help us to produce orthogonality and unit length to give us an orthonormal basis for S. So treating it like a projection problem, we're going to build a matrix A which uses the columns as V1 and V2. So A is the matrix whose first column is V1, 1, 1, 0, 0, and whose second column is V2, 1, 0, 1, 0. OK, great. So now that we have this matrix, what do we do with it? We've got to compute the eigenvectors, not of A. A isn't a square matrix, so A is not going to have any eigenvectors or eigenvalues. But A transpose times A will be a square matrix. And so hopefully it will have eigenvalues and eigenvectors. In fact, because it's symmetric, the previous theorem guarantees that it will. So we compute A transpose A, just chewing out the matrix product. And we get the matrix 2, 1, 1, 2. Remember that what that represents is a linear transformation from this two-dimensional space on the left in the domain of A back to itself. OK, so how do we find the eigenvectors? We'll just run through the eigenvector eigenvalue analysis as quickly as we can. First, we need the eigenvalues of 2, 1, 1, 2, which we can find by insisting that the determinant of A minus lambda i, uh, sorry, A transpose A minus lambda i, be equal to 0. So we'll subtract lambda, our unknown eigenvalue, on the diagonal of our matrix, take the determinant, set it equal to 0, and get a polynomial equation which we can solve for lambda. Here, multiplying it all out gives me the quadratic lambda squared minus 4 lambda plus 3 is equal to 0, whose solutions, the eigenvalues, are lambda equals 3 and lambda equals 1. Now that we know what the eigenvalues are, finding the eigenvectors is a matter of solving the system av equals lambda v, or better yet, a minus lambda i times v is equal to 0. So we augment our a minus lambda i matrix with zeros on the right-hand side. We put in our eigenvalue. Let's say I put in 3. And then we describe the solution set of this system. So simplifying this matrix out, we get negative 1, 1, 1, negative 1. Doing the row reduction on it just wipes out the second row. So we get one bound variable, x, and one free variable, y. And so to describe the solution space, what I'll do is just choose a value for my free variable. Let's choose, say, 1. And so if I choose a 1 for y, then because x is bound to y, that determines a value for x. Negative x plus 1 is equal to 0, implies x is equal to 1. And so I get a vector, 1, 1, which is an eigenvector for the eigenvalue 3 for this matrix 2, 1, 1, 2. So we're going to call that u1 our first eigenvector of A transpose A. If we do the same thing for our other eigenvalue, lambda equals 1, subtracting 1 on the diagonal of my matrix gives me 1, 1, 1, 1. Doing the row reduction on that matrix again wipes out the second row, gives me x as a bound variable, y as a free variable, which means I can choose a value for y. Again, let's choose an easy value like 1. And then that will determine the value for the bound variable x by solving that equation, x equals negative 1. And so we get a second eigenvector, u2, let's call it, negative 1, 1, which is an eigenvector for the eigenvalue 1 for the matrix 2, 1, 1, 2. So now we have the eigenvectors of A transpose A. What do we do with them to get our orthonormal basis for our subspace S, which is way over here in R4? All we have to do is multiply each of those eigenvectors by A. A is this rectangular matrix. So if I multiply A by U1, 1, 1, I get the vector 2, 1, 1, 0. That's just a simple matrix product. If I multiply A by U2, my other eigenvector, negative 1, 1, I'll get the vector 0, minus 1, 1, 0. OK, great. We can pretty easily verify that those two vectors are in the same span as v1 and v2 are. Both of those vectors belong to s. 
and they're linearly independent, so they will both form a basis for S. But what they have that V1 and V2 did not have is that they are orthogonal. We can check, just take the dot product of one with the other, we get zero. And that's a huge win for us. Because once I have an orthogonal set, all I need to do to make it orthonormal is to normalize it. Divide each of them by its own length, the square root of its dot product with itself. 2, 1, 1, 0. If I dot it with itself, I get uh, 6. So I'll divide it by the square root of 6. 0, negative 1, 1, 0. If I divide it by its uh, own length, I'll be dividing by the square root of 2. And now that new set is orthonormal. So this is kind of a slick way to discover an orthonormal basis for a subspace. And the price we pay here is that we have to end up solving an eigenvalue eigenvector problem. But if we're comfortable doing that, or if we're comfortable asking some technology to do that for us, then all it will take for us is to take the eigenvectors of A transpose A, where the columns of A are any basis that we choose, and multiply each of those eigenvectors by A to give me an orthogonal basis for S. And then all I have to do is divide each of them by its length to make that set orthonormal.